Okay. Welcome everyone to the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library. This is the second installment of Art Gottlieb's The Cold War a Historical Perspective. Um, I would like to thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring this program. Uh, without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Art Gottlieb. Hi everyone. So today's part two, thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed last week's session. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, please uh, toss it in the chat room or somehow get our attention, raise, our hand, raise your hand. Um, I'd rather answer your questions sooner than later so that whatever's built on past that point, you can put it in proper context. Uh, last week's program took us up to World War I or thereabouts. And uh, for today's presentation, I have on my bullet point over here, um, Nazism, Marxism, liberal capitalism, which I covered a little bit last time, uh, World War II, um, an unlikely alliance, Barbarossa, seeds of the Cold War and victory over Germany and Japan. And this is absolutely a critical period of time for our discussion on the Cold War, um, be right before World War II and during World War II and after uh, just in the immediate post-war era. And, um, I wonder if you thought uh, to yourselves like I thought to myself and uh, remember, you know, fervently about, you know, what the Cold War seemed like to me, you know, even as a young person in the 1960s and as a teenager in the 1970s uh, in the context of things that I mentioned to you, you know, the importance of, uh, you know, the ubiquitous nature of the Vietnam War and, you um, the uh, ever-present um, civil defense system that was that was active everywhere uh, around me. It seemed, and, you know, in an, in an urban area, uh, all of the basements of the buildings that were built were all, you know, had to be um, uh, had to qualify as a, a shelter to keep everyone there who lived in the apartment building. You know, this sort of like this very bleak, concrete sort of open areas, you know, while you had your laundry basket walking to where the laundry room was. Um, you know, it was just normal. It was civil, uh, civil defense and fallout shelter. The signs were all over the place, you know, and uh, the 915 on Friday mornings, the air raid sirens. Um, the entire civil defense system, the, the interruptions on radio, uh, certainly a lot of AM that I listened to back in those days, probably like most of us. And it was, this is a test, only a test of the emergency broadcast system. Um, and then, you know, after the, after 1990s, all of that was allowed to go down into the wayside uh, because it was like, like I mentioned to you before, I mean, who's there left to fight? You know, and we have um, a little bit of return to some of this, uh, not to that degree, I guess, um, but for a new generation, I'm doing um, focus on contemporary issues tonight in Darien, seven o'clock to eight o'clock for that audience. And, you know, some of the things we've discussed only in the past few weeks or, you know, will Russia use uh, tactical or strategic nuclear weapons? in um in ukraine uh are the iranians developing a nuclear capacity uh to launch or or even harbor in their arsenal uh nuclear weapons and um korea has been launching intermediate uh short immediate and medium range ballistic missiles uh in some cases, right over Japan. Uh, and North Korea has made sure that everybody knows that those missiles, if you didn't already know it, are nuclear capable missiles. So, so what do we have with all of this? 
we have what a new cold war um in modern terms does that mean e economic does that mean just military does it mean the fear of nuclear weapons being exchanged that's another question we can leave to another time right now i'll get back to our our tension with the soviets right which is what this was about in this era it was about the soviet union and people we felt were directly aligned with the soviet union in the form of being client states um, from the united states perspective right so those are the parameters of this discussion now i have the first on my list here nazism marxism and liberal capitalism and as i mentioned just a moment ago that's something that we touched briefly upon last time um, you know, Marxism is a social order. Um, we see that a lot in our philosophical thinking, even portions today, how much of our society is truly still capitalistic, how much of it is actually socialist, um, what does it mean, is it a threat? Uh, as, it, as it applies to our discussion, the problem with Marxism from the standpoint of us versus them in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, particularly, was that a Marxism represented a godless uh, society where the state, that is the central government, that's what is meant by the state in this regard. The central government is the ultimate authority and everything flows down from that ultimate authority, right? And to give you a contrast to that, um, in its traditional form, at least, our, our constitutional republic and our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, um, our standing in the world was always, we were the opposite of that. We, have a constitution that is there to defend the rights and liberties of the individual and of the individual states. In other words, it's the decentralization of power. Now, this is something I get into constantly with people because a lot of that has changed in the 20th century, even in the context of what we're talking about here back in the days of, uh, you know, like I said to you, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I just did a program this morning on Eleanor Roosevelt and an overlap into the um, FDR's New Deal. And many people were afraid that Franklin Delano Roosevelt's programs were gonna turn us into a, a socialist nation, right? Which was practically a term that was synonymous with communism, right? Uh, because even Lenin said that the purpose of a communist state was to ensure worldwide socialism, you see? So when, the world was expecting um, to fall into communism as a better alternative to obviously a fail of capitalism after the fall of the, uh, stock, the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression, people were scared. They were looking for communists under their, you know, under their pillows, you see. And uh, so when you had situations where it seemed like the federal government in the New Deal in the 1930s was centralizing markets and literally controlling what up to that point would had always been uh, left to the private sector to decide and Adam Smith's silent hand of correcting the marketplace if one company was mishandling its power. Um, now the federal government was doing it and it was a big scare. It was like a red scare. And um, is it socialism to have, um, say for instance, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which still exists by the way. Now you have the federal government that is gonna own a massive source of of um, uh, power distribution and generation. Well, that sounds communist to me, what's next, you see? So this was something that was alive and well in the 1930s, you know, when you have shades of that today, today we have more of a 
cultural Marxism that people are concerned about. In other words, are people's psychology and their sociology today being uh, conditioned to think like a socialist nation, right? And once again, that, that particular subject is in context only as it's peripheral to what we're talking about. But the fear of communism and the United States being taken over of communism has never left, right? It's been there right since the beginning of the Bolshevik revolution. Uh, because Marx had it aptly said that where his experiment would take the best hold, that of a communist state, um, leading to global socialism, would be in an industrialized society like the United States. <clears throat> so in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, particularly, uh, the United States was still pretty homogenous in its belief system of us versus them. You know, um, up to that point, you know, a lot of people were still pretty religious. Um, these, these things have changed a lot, even in the last 30 years since the 1990s, primarily from the technological and cultural revolution, social revolution, as a result of the internet. The internet has actually changed America's... Mm, physical and psycho-emotional isolation, right? Beforehand, we used to, even in World War II standpoint, in World War II standpoint, I mean, Japan was an awfully far away place, right? And so is China, and so is Europe for that matter, maybe not as far. You see, but when the internet came in, um, you have generations now of people who have actually grown up with the entire world at their fingertips, and it really doesn't matter where you are, and it doesn't matter who you are, you know, you all kind of have this common denominator of being this person on the internet, and it took away any kind of, you know, physical sense, an emotional sense that went with it, that we were us over here, and they're them over there. Now, from a worldwide togetherness standpoint, you know, that is a a glad thing. There's nothing wrong with that, right? It's about time we all started acting like one big happy family as far as the world is concerned. Isn't that what we've been fighting for all of this time, right? And remember, Marx himself said that, you know, as soon as all of these differences are gone and there's nothing left to fight for, well, then there'd be nothing left to be, there'd be not, there'd be no more wars, right? So our companies that have like the Googles and uh, Facebooks and things like that, um, you know, over, had a more of a, a global sense of their own identity than an American sense of their own identity. And I'm not saying that any of that is wrong. It's just changed the way we've looked at things from the standpoint of the 1980s, even uh, before the internet um, and the generations that follow think of the world in different terms than pre-internet, you see? So that is my point to you. You're speaking to somebody who's always grown up with a computer in front of them, uh, let alone a, a smartphone phone in front of them. And uh, like the current generation coming up, um, people who have had the experience like I did when I was a young kid have a different viewpoint of the us versus them or this identity versus that identity. You see, that's what I wanted to put in context for us today. So uh, liberal capitalism, of course, means total free speech, a tolerance for other people. I mean, that's what a liberal education is or was. And it, the, the point is, is that you have the, all of these in college, you have all of these different viewpoints and you're bombarded with things that are intended to challenge your preconceived notions um, and a free expression of ideas, uh, which is what the traditional liberalism is, right? When I was a, um, I don't know, a teenager and I was in my twenties, um, I was, I mean, I grew up in the liberal tradition, uh, which meant that you had a tremendous tolerance for everybody else, right? And you were allowed to speak your mind, even if I hated what you were saying. And I was allowed to speak my mind, even if you hated what I was saying, you see, as opposed to, right, what you saw in the Soviet Union, 
right, and Maoist China and North Korea and any other expression of communism back in those days, which is like, if you said the wrong thing or if it wasn't a state approved message, well, you were, as we say today in Putin's Russia, you, you were disappeared, right? You just, you're just gone one day, you see? Um, so that was another example of the, death, the thems versus the us's, right? Liberal capitalism versus Marxism. Marxism takes a more hard line on what you have to do to create a utopian state. And if you have to use oppressive uh, means to get to utopia, then that's what you have to do. And this was seen even uh, more severely uh, in the form of Maoist communist China than the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, as far as Mao was concerned, was communism light. Uh, Chairman Mao thought that the Stalinists didn't do go nearly far enough in impressing their own people to achieve successful communism. And that's something I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, it's very important to understand these things. But back in back in these days, even in Maoist China, um, we didn't really see China as the primary player. You know, we were still we in our own. You know, not naivete. It was more of a blindness. Okay. Uh, that we didn't really look at China as a primary communist problem. We were angry that it was communist. And I'll tell you the story, um, maybe at the end of today, if I've got the time, about MacArthur in China. And it's a very interesting one, you know, because we understand the Cold War through the lens that we actually perceive the Cold War here in the West, primarily the United States. And Nazism, of course, was, as I told you, I think last time, you know, Nazism was based on fascism. It's a socialist society um, that is based on nationalist themes. And the nationalist themes means it's kind of like, well, we're going to focus on Germany. And we're, it's, but it's going to be a social society because what we're doing in our oppressive fascism is really for the people. Right, which is something you usually see in socialism one way or the other, right? If you look at the different kinds of titles that socialist countries or communist countries have, they're usually the people's republic of, or the people's this, or the people's that. So in communism, you get to say, um, or in fascism as it were, because they're really the same in that regard, masquerading as freedom, is that you get to say that, well, we're gonna repress you, but it's for the people is for your own good, right? From the top down, right? And the problem with these things always is that there was an elite class that lived, that seemed to be in contradiction to the notion that we're all the same, right? If we're all the same, then how come you're not down here starving like the rest of us, right? Which was always like a central, a central hypocrisy, certainly with the Soviet Union, as it were. I mean, if you were a member of the Communist Party, you weren't shopping in the same store that the average proletariat was, right? You, if you were part of, uh, if you were a Russian naval officer, you and your family weren't living in the same quarters as the average person was, you see? So it, it had an inherent contradiction to it, uh, which even in today's sentiments in our own country, people are concerned about. If everything is being done from politicians for the standpoint of the greater good, how is it that we have what is sometimes perceived to be an elite class that seems to be impervious to the rules that they're making for everybody else? You see, all of these things in our society reflect back to the fear of, like in the 1930s, is this reflections of, so of socialism, you see? And somehow like the people who are voting these things in are like the proverbial frog in a, uh, a, a pot of water, water that's being heated on the stove, that you, it, it happens so incrementally that you don't know you're actually being cooked, you see. <clears throat> World War II was 
Well, I think that most historians would agree with me by saying World War II was really like a continuation of World War I, right? It is like one big world war and it was World War Part, part One and World War Part Two, right? So the, the seeds of World War II were already firmly planted in the ground and watered by the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 in the palace of, what was it, Mirrors in Versailles, France. And, um, and as I mentioned to you last time, you know, Germany and Russia had a non-aggression pact that they signed in 1940, right? And uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which basically said, okay, you know, Russia, uh, if we, Germany, you know, should do something, right, air quotes, something, uh, you don't interfere with what we're doing. And if you, Soviet Russia, do something, air quotes, something, we, Germany, won't do anything about it. Uh, you know, I want to just give you a footnote and say that this is the same exact thing that communist China did with Vladimir Putin earlier this year and be right before the invasion of Ukraine. OK, it was like the same kind of non-aggression pact, mutual agreements, mutual support pact. Uh, it happened right before the Olympics or actually during the Olympics where Xi Jinping met with uh, Vladimir Putin. Basically, each one of them pledged to the other. You do what you got to do, and we're not going to say anything about it. You, China. And China said to Russia, you do what you got to do, and we're not going to say anything about it. Right. And it was the same similar sort of thing. The purpose of this in 1940 was for Germany to expand its frontier into Poland. Uh, and certainly the uh, Germans, well, Hitler, didn't think that France or, or, or England was actually going to all of a sudden grow a backbone and do anything about it. He felt as though because of the history of 1937, 38, and 39, where there was a lot of noise that occurred when Germany, you know, uh, completely reversed its commitments to the Treaty of Versailles and rearmed itself and put its troops back in places where the Treaty of Versailles said that it couldn't have troops anymore. And nobody did anything about it. You know, as a matter of fact, people felt kind of guilty about the way World War I ended and the punitive nature of the Treaty of Versailles that, uh, you know, it, even Great Britain was like, okay, well, we understand you want to have a Navy. So, you know, we'll come up with an agreement where you can go ahead and build ships again and that sort of thing, right? And, um, but, Seeing that even by 1939 standards, even Neville Chamberlain had seen that Hitler couldn't really be trusted to make a deal with, right? Because the Munich Agreement of 1938 that said that Hitler was just going to take the part of Western Czechoslovakia known as the Sudetenland, and that's all he wanted. Um, and then, of course, right after that, he just went and just took the whole damn country. See, so even even Neville Chamberlain knew that now Hitler, you can't make a deal with Hitler, right? I mean, that's like a quote: "You can't make a deal with Hitler." And so, what happened was that the British, as a preventative measure, got the French to go along with the British, and British and French made a deal with Poland, right? And they said that we are going to protect Poland in case Poland's borders are infringed upon, right? Now, you know, you can see the handwriting on the wall at this point. The next thing that Hitler would want to go for would be Poland, even though he said he wasn't going to do that, of course. You see, so as a preventive measure, Neville Chamberlain and France thought that if it was public knowledge now in an agreement with Poland, that should Hitler invade Poland, that would mean war with England and France, that that would give Hitler, um, shall we say, a pause, right? And say, maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe England and France are going to, you know, uh, they wouldn't have made this, this, this mutual defense pact 
unless they meant business. Well, Hitler decided to roll the dice. And he was like, um, it was kind of like Putin when he went back into Ukraine. You know, it was like, all right, people are going to make a lot of noise about it. They're going to be mad at me, but that's okay because they're already mad at me. You know, that kind of sort of thing, right? And like after Crimea. And, and, and um, but this time, England gave Germany two and a half days to remove its troops from Poland. And it says you got to remove your troops from Poland. Or, you know, according to this defense treaty we made with them, we're going to be at war, right? Neville Chamberlain gets on the air on September 3rd and says, um, you know, we've tried to contact the Germans and ask them if they're removing their troops. And we have received no such word of any such thing. Therefore, I regret to tell you that this nation is now at war with Germany. Boom, World War II, September 3rd, 1939. See, so what does this mean for Russia? Well, Russia got the Eastern part of Poland. That's what it meant, right? And not only that, but Russia is allied with Germany, you see. Now, Hitler had learned something in World War I, right? He was, the, the central feature of Hitler's life was the trauma that ensued for, for Germany losing World War I, right? Because uh, Germany shouldn't, wasn't supposed to lose World War I. Germany was 50 miles outside of Paris, right? And this is what leads to Hitler's quest for answers about how some giant conspiracy of Jews, um, you know, the international financiers that were of course all Jews, right? had conspired to end the war because it was monetarily in their favor or something, and even German ones. And, um, and so Hitler, this was the, you got stabbed in the back theory, right? So um, as far as um, Hitler was concerned, um, Germany should have been the rightful victors in World War I, right? So, he didn't really want to fight the English, right? Or the French for that matter. Um, his, if you read Mein Kampf, which is a very, very important book to understand all of this, Hitler's goal was actually to go into, right? The Slavic regions, into Ukraine, into Russia proper, and actually subjugate that entire country. Right, and have that whole vast region, you know, particularly Ukraine and, and areas beyond, as a new breadbasket, as a new, like um, Hitler wanted for Germany, like what the Louisiana Purchase was for the United States, except he wasn't going to buy it. He was going to take it the old fashioned way. And um, I mean, after all, what was going to stop him because the Russians were inferior people, because the whole country was, I don't know, the whole system of government there, as I told you last time, was inherently corrupt because Hitler saw communism as a Jewish project, right? And um, interesting for Hitler, I mean, see, capitalism was a Jewish project, and so was communism. You see, which was one another reason why fascism was the safe spot for Hitler in between, right? From a rational standpoint or a logical standpoint, you would think that that would have more to do with politics. But yeah, I always have to think with Hitler, everything starts with racism first and then politics second, you see, or rationality second, if that's a term you want to even apply to, to Hitler, right? You know, he had to be in a Jew, Jew free zone, Hitler, right? Which means that Capitalism was out and so was communism, you see? And as I mentioned to you last time, there are people in this country who kind of like turned a blind eye to Hitler in the 1930s because our primary enemies, or at least ideologically, were the communists. And Hitler hated the communists so bad that we said, you know, all right, well, Hitler is, you know, the guy's a, a whack job, but who cares? The guy is our primary firewall in Europe against communism. So let Hitler and the Soviets kill each other. And um, I mean, all right, well, you know, so the guy, uh, apparently he doesn't like Jews, but come to think of it, neither do we. Yeah, right. So that's the way actually we looked at it 
unless you were Jewish, you know what I mean? But the majority of people here in this country during the 1930s, 1940s, I mean, there's a lot of people who weren't happy to have either A, Catholics around or B, Jews around. So there you have that. And um, so now the war is going on, right? You got the fall of France in 1940. The United States completely mobilizes after the fall of France in the summer of 1940, because we're like, oh, you know, I mean, you can be you can you can be in a total state of denial about what's going on in the world. But after the fall of France, the largest single standing army in Europe falls in six weeks at the hands of the Nazis. OK. Britain is is teetering and may actually make a deal also. Right. And so the United States goes on this massive spending spree in 1940. And we were like, uh, we need an army. We need a two ocean Navy. We need an air force uh, where all of this doesn't exist, right? So we literally spent like in 1940 money about a trillion and a half dollars, which I don't know, that's gotta be a whopping amount of money, okay? And we were able to pay off that debt, by the way because after World War II, the United States was like the only industrial society left standing intact, you see? So we were there to literally rebuild the world um, at a high profit, I might add, okay? Not to disparage the intentions of it. You know, that's why we were able to pay off that debt, right? We're certainly in that, that situation now, the debt that we have, we don't have that mechanism to pay it off the way we did in, the late 1940s, early 1950s. It's a big difference between the world then and now. So um, so Europe is in Hitler's hands. And then there's this question for Hitler about, well, what about Great Britain? Well, we're gonna have to invade the island of Great Britain now. Right, we're going to have to invade the British Isles, and the navies turns around and say, "Well, an amphibious invasion? You didn't mention that before. We don't have any amphibious ships. You know, we don't. We don't. That means like you got to take a whole army across the water and like invade Great Britain. We can't do that. So we've got to build it up. In the meantime, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, is going to like beat the hell out of the Royal Air Force, and then once." the Luftwaffe has aerial superiority over Great Britain, well, then we'll be able to invade. Now, that's the story of the Battle of Britain. That's the story of the Blitz. Make a long story short, the Germans lose. They don't have air superiority. So come the following year now in 1941, Hitler says the hell with it. And he quietly re re withdraws his forces from Western France and this whole aerial offensive and planned sea invasion of Great Britain called Operation Sea Lion, by the way. And he quietly regroups everything on the Eastern frontier in the massive single land invasion in history. Right, this wide sweeping, large front invasion of Russia, right? So now in 1941, the Germans launched the true purpose of World War II in Hitler's eyes, which is conquest of Lebensraum, that's living space, elbow room for Germany in the East, right? And now they march into Russia with tanks, airplanes, troops, horses, you name it, right? This massive, gigantic thing. And Germany was supposed to capture Moscow. It was supposed to capture um, Stalingrad particularly, right? And um, Russia became this vast wasteland that kind of swallowed up the Germans the same way it swallowed up Napoleon, you see? Now Stalin, his gamble of making the deal with Hitler to begin with gave him a year to get his act together, right? Because he had purged his forces or at least the command structure of his forces during the 1930s, right? Because, you know, um, Stalin and people like Stalin, you know, they have, you're surrounded by people who tell you what you wanna hear 
and they're a bunch of sycophants and there's always the threat that people are going to conspire against you. And since you're the dictator after all, well, if you're not sure, why don't you just kill them all and start from scratch? You see, so nobody can ever really group together against you. You see, that was Stalin. And so he had no leaders, had an army, but he had no leaders. You see, so this thing of him making a deal with Hitler in 1940 gave him a year, right? Um, to actually get betrayed by Hitler. And that's what happened. Now, this is very important from a kind of like a psychological standpoint uh, for, for Stalin, because this event was rather dramatic. It was, he was in, indeed betrayed by the Germans. Um, and not only that, it needs to be remembered, you know, and I'll remind you this after when we get to the end of our program, Russia lost more people in World War II than all other operations combined. You see, the amount of people that got lost in, 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 in Stalin's Russia at the hands of the Germans, right, militarily and civilian, uh, is, is superior than every other thing combined for all other countries. It's, it's staggering, okay? Um, the Russians were raped, they were pillaged, they were burned, they were driven over, um, they were starved. It was, the, the Germans were absolutely brutal in the way that from a race standpoint, the Germans saw themselves as superior race to the Russians, you see, that the Russians not down as far as the Jews were, but the Russians were the untermenschen, right? So in other words, you treat them like animals. Like I'm gonna keep you alive, not because I see you as human being having intrinsic value as myself, right? I'm keeping you alive because maybe you're gonna be good for doing manual labor, you see, or something like that, right? So this was something that created a kind of psychological trauma for a Stalin. That was one of the seeds of the Cold War, right? And when this whole thing was over, should they live through it, Stalin was going to create a buffer zone for himself on the western part of his country and elsewhere, right? That was going to now be a cover from his own ambition for Soviet expansion by saying that we want to create a buffer zone around Russia because we are never going to be um, vulnerable like this ever again, you see? Uh, so you see how that, you know, Barbarossa actually creates the justification in Stalin's mind to actually create, well, like, for instance, this whole zone between the actual border of Russia or the USSR territories and what uh, is described as the Iron Curtain, you see? And, um, I don't know if Russia would have done it anyway, but certainly this gave him the justification. Now, as far as we're concerned, you know, World War II for the United States, as far as the Russians were concerned, I mean, this was a bit of an odd situation, right? We're a constitutional republic, right? The British, is a constitutional monarchy, parliamentary and monarchy. And then you have this communist state of Russia, right? And now we're all allies, you see? And the only reason we were allies with the Russians is because the allies, because the Russians became allies with the British. As soon as Hitler invaded Russia, then it became this unlikely bedfellow because now that your enemy is the same as my enemy, you and I must be friends, you see? So we can defeat our common enemy. But if you've ever watched uh, the, the movie that probably does the, um, the best job of, of putting this, this paradox on the table would be the actual movie with George C. Scott Patton, right? 
which you've probably all seen, you know, being somebody who's interested in this subject matter, right? So Patton is like, you know, he doesn't have much time for the politics of political correctness. And if you think it's being frustrating, or at least I'll say, speak my bells, myself, if you think that you've got to be careful walking on eggshells sometimes in, in a world that seems to be very, very um, delicate in its sensibilities about what comes out of your mouth, right? I mean, Patton was fish out of water. He was, he was a 19th century person in the 20th century world. And there he was, and he's making cracks about the Russians, and he's making cracks about this, you know. And it, it didn't matter that it was true, but you're not allowed to say it. You see what I mean? Because it, 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 it makes it seem as though, you know, we're better than them. And if we're better than them, that's bad for politics because we're all supposed to be fighting on the same side here, you see. Uh, and then another thing for Patton was that, you know, all right, well, when the, all of this over, I mean, Patton was like, is it me or doesn't anybody else realize that we're going to go back to hating each other? You know, and so as long as we hate each other, as long as we're technically enemies, right, why don't we just kick their asses right now while we're in Europe? You see what I mean? And all of this kind of thinking and all this kind of things that that came out of Patton's mouth one way or the other were the things that got him in such hot water and eventually fired, right? Fired like twice, actually. And you just not, you can't say it, right? Another one was MacArthur. We'll get to him later, right? He actually had more power to affect his policies, but his own ego got in his way and got himself fired by the, the relatively diminutive um, Harry S. Truman, you see? So, so there we are though, we're allies. And all kinds of war materials are going to Russia now from the United States and going across the Atlantic and braving the German submarines. And we're going not only from Great Britain, but we're taking this North Atlantic one, right, which is going to uh, Murmansk and Archangel, right? So now you got to go up the North Sea, right, by the Arctic Circle. And I'll have to tell you how cold it is up there. Right. And not only that, but that entire shipping route of all of these arsenal of democracy type of materials, tanks, airplanes, fuel, bullets, bombs, you know, all of the stuff of war, right, is in now in range of all of the coastal aircraft from Norway, because Norway is completely occupied by the Germans. Right. It became really uh, one of the, if the, not the most precise area to be uh, lethal for anybody traveling through it. But we pumped all of these supplies and equipment in, into Russia. So Russia could go ahead and do war with their enemy, which was our enemy. And the Russians did it in a sense, right? Um, our feeding Russia with materials was not unlike us feeding materials to the Ukrainians right now. You see what I mean? The idea was that you're going to stalemate the war in Russia. And then the Russians or what happened with the Germans in Russia was they, they didn't have their quick victories, right? Because they had the Russians fought back. Uh, and they were supplied with technology and equipment. I don't want to say it's because of the United States that the Russians beat the Germans, but it is certainly a percentage of that is true, you see. And, um, and what happens was the Germans had, it turned out to be a much longer war in Russia, and then they wound up there, which they were never intending to be over the Russian winter. And the Germans are in Russia now over the Russian winter, and they were not prepared for it because it wasn't supposed to last that long, you see. And uh, now the Germans are freezing to death because they're not supplied with the proper winter clothing, right? And they had these big drives back in Germany for every any coat you can possibly donate to the soldiers on the Eastern Front. Right. I don't care if they're fur coats, wool coats, whatever the kind of coats they are, you know, big socks, underwear, anything. Right. And this is humiliating for the Germans, of course. 
Another big problem the Germans had in the middle of Russia, being there in the middle of the uh, winter, was the fact that their vehicles weren't designed or modified to be able to handle sub-zero temperatures, right? You ever go out to your car and it's like zero degrees outside and you turn the, the ignition and it sounds like maybe it's not even gonna start? Well, all of the German equipment, it didn't have, I don't know how much you know about mechanical things, but you know the oil that they ran in the engines wasn't designed for that type of low temperature. So the oil itself became too thick you know, so when it was cold. So when you go to start the engine, the, your, the mechanical parts are moving through this jelly consistency fluid, which was the thick oil. And it didn't have the, the mechanical capacity to even turn the engine over, you see? I mean, that, that put the Germans practically out of business. They had to run these things all the time, which meant that they used up twice as much fuel as they needed to without going anywhere, right? Uh, they were all freezing to death. And uh, this was a big, big, big problem. Uh, and the Germans were fighting the Russians, you know, till 1944, until the, Germ until the Russians finally launched their own major counteroffensive. Well, actually, this happened in 1943, but through 1944, we're driving the Germans back out of Russia and then back eventually towards Germany, you see? Now, the reason I tell you this long story is not just to give you a chronological timeline of this, but there's a very important part about the Cold War, the origins of Cold War and all of this. And that is simply this. Russia felt that Stalin, let me put it more succinctly, Stalin felt that the United States and Great Britain were dragging its heels as far as opening up another major front of the war, right? Which ultimately was to become D-Day, right? June 6, 1944, right? Stalin, now that the United States is in the war after December 7th, 1941, actually, we weren't in the European war until Germany declared war on the United States on December 11th, 1941, right? So then now, you know, it's a world war. It's a global war. We're in it. We're allies with the British, all the rest of that. And so Stalin was like, you know, we're here fighting these Germans, through 1939, uh, through 1941 into 1942, 1942 into 1943. And Stalin's complaint, right, was that the British and the Americans were deliberately allowing the Germans and the Russians kill each other off. That was, Rush, that was Russia's point. So you're not launching a second invasion so that Germany is gonna have to take half of its troops that are in Russia and go fight on a second front because you invaded. Stalin told the allies that you are deliberately not doing this because you hate communism. We know you hate communism, and even though we're supposed to be allies, you're deliberating allowing this war of attrition going on in Russia that are going to kill off, obviously, the Germans, but us too, deliberately, because after the Germans are gone, you wish we were gone. You see, that is a massive uh, point of origin for the post-war Cold War, okay? was Stalin's resentment towards the allies. And Stalin was like, yeah, I know you're trying to find the right spot, but you know what? We're dying by the thousands here, you know? And then of course, eventually we, um, in 1943, we invade uh, as the movie in uh, uh, Patton depicts, we go from North Africa, right? into Sicily, you see? We launch from Tunisia to Sicily, then from Sicily over the Straits of Messina into Italy, and then we have the entire Italian campaign, right? And then Italy capitulates. Uh, 
Um, and then, uh, so we consider that to be a second front, right? But for Stalin, that was, that was pennies on the dollar. He wanted a massive second front where half of the German army that was killing Russians, right, in Russia would have to literally be diverted by Hitler and put as a matter of a necessity on some Western front, right, which was ultimately going to be the coast of France. Uh, and then it would take heat off of the Russians. You see, so Russia, hit, um, Stalin felt a deep resentment, which he never let go of, that the Allies were deliberately trying to sacrifice the Russians, right, under the guise of, well, what are you going to do? We're not ready yet. You see what I mean? And that gave Stalin, once again, a lot of license to do what he did after the war, because he didn't trust the Allies. And he wanted to create that buffer state, right? Any questions up to this point? All right. So we have um, the invasion of Normandy in 1944, June 6th. And then, of course, you know, the Germans are being squeezed back to the German frontier, right? The Russians are coming from the east, and the Allies are coming from the west. Uh, Germany is retreating, uh, seemingly on all fronts. And, um, well, Germany's going to lose. So we start having these conferences, right? The uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's, the Winston Churchill's, the Premier Stalin. And basically what these guys are talking about is like, how are we going to handle the, um, a Germany that is going to lose? And how are we going to handle a post-Nazi Germany, right? So it's not like you have a country that is going to be, you know, liberated from Nazism and then they just go back to what they were doing the next day, like Nazism never happened, you see? You know, this is a similar situation like we had, um, at least in the regard that I'm going to be talking about it, is like when the United States, whether you agree with it or not, um, invaded um, uh, Iraq. Remember Saddam Hussein? Remember him? And, and, and the problem was you just couldn't like liberate the country and let everybody run it who was already there without Saddam Hussein. The problem was that everybody who was running the country was part of Saddam Hussein's party, which was the Ba'athist party. And the Ba'athist party was like the Nazi party as far as we were concerned. And so you had to get rid of all the Ba'athists and find other people to run it, right? Who were probably Ba'athists anyway, who just lied about it. And, but that's another story for another day. You see, so in, in, and it took this whole long period of time where all this chaos ensued, right? That we didn't anticipate because we didn't plan well enough for it. Um, and um, so what you have here now is a situation where the Germans, are going to be able to have to rule their own country, but we don't want Nazis running it, right? Which means that there's going to have to be a period of who knows how long, five years, 10 years, two years, where Germany can go back to kind of like a pre-Nazi government. They're going to need a new currency. They're going to need new leaders. They're going to have to redo their constitution. They're going to have to reinstate laws that were all pre-Nazi laws, right? And, and to do that, you're going to have the victorious powers rule the country of Germany until that point ensues, right? So that means that you've got this divided Germany. You've got the Russian sector. You've got the American sector. You've got the British sector. Uh, and there's actually a French sector too, right? And um, these are the uh, various occupation zones. 
And that was just supposed to last until Germany had once again unified itself and was able to have a, and they were just going to go back to being Germany. Now, you know as well as I do that um, uh oh. Hang on a second, folks. Just a minute. So you know is what, can you still see me all right? Because I just lost myself. You're still good, I'm going to see you. Okay, thank you. I just can't see you. I hit the wrong button. So anyway, so what happens here is that um, Germany is not going to be reunified because the Russians have actually no intention whatsoever of actually relinquishing control of any of the occupation territories that they had, all right? And um, that's something that Stalin lied about and he actually duped Franklin Delano Roosevelt about it. And there we go. He duped Franklin Delano Roosevelt about it. Stalin was very poker faced, right? And if you think about like a Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin's model was Stalin, right? And Stalin had this poker faced, which is kind of like, I am going to use you Westerners and your liberalism and your equality, and I'm going to use it against you. Right. And I'm going to let you be as benevolent as possible. And I am going to take everything and give nothing. And the point was that all of these places in between the Russian frontier and the border of the Soviet zone, the western border of the Soviet zone, which was in the middle of Germany. Right. And included Berlin, by the way. Stalin had no intention of giving an inch of that ground back. You see, not an inch. And he felt justified by it, by the resentment he felt that the West had left him out to dry and killed hundreds of thousands of Russians based on our own aggressiveness towards the Russians by letting them die from not starting a, a second front soon enough, right? Plus the paranoia of actually having his country be invaded, right, by the Germans to begin with and being betrayed by that. So that entire region, right, the Balkans, Poland, Czechoslovakia, all of the rest of these places were never ever going to be liberated, ever, right? The West thought they were, because naturally that's what Stalin said, right? We're going to go, well, the war is going to be over. Germany's going to go back to doing their thing, you know, and we're going to go home. But Russia was never going home. They were never going home and they knew they were never going home, you see? So Russia felt justified in doing this, for the reasons why I've mentioned. And we felt justified in thinking that Russia was this avaricious country for having done it, right? After this whole thing was over. I mean, G Germany was reunified in effect um, in uh, only a couple of years later, you know, only like by 1948. Germany was ready to stand on its own two feet to have its monetary currency put back in the new Reich mark and all the rest of that. And what happened was that the West, the, you know, Great Britain, France and the United States said, yeah, all right, well, that's it. Let's all go home now. Germany's ready to go. And Russia deliberately said, no, 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 we don't accept what the Germans are doing and we don't accept their new monetary standard. And then, boom, that's where you had that map that I grew up with when I was a kid in school, which was West Germany and East Germany. 
boom, there it is. Bah. And then from East Germany, you had the Iron Curtain, you see, and the Iron Curtain was the Iron Curtain countries were countries that um, remember those sham referendum that we had, or we're calling them sham referenda referenda that the Russians had the other like two weeks ago. Right. You must have heard about that, where Russia goes and they put a gun against somebody's head and say, you want to be part of the of Russia, don't you? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be part of Russia. See that they want to be part of Russia. Let's vote on it while the gun's still to your head. See that they voted. They want to be part of Russia. Right. So that is, at least from our point of view, what happened. Right. I mean, obviously, if Vladimir Putin was here, he would have a different story. Right. And after he would tell me a story, I would stab him in the eye. OK, I know this is on recording and that was highly homicidal thought. All right. Um, please forgive me. But the thing is with Russia was that Stalin, they had their way of 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 drilling into every one of their governments that were the pre-war governments, filling them full of communists and literally flipping the government from the inside out. You infiltrate the government and you actually flip the government. You see, you know, I mean, the Germans did this in Austria before the war. I mean, they went, they had this guy named um, Arthur Sysinkwart, right? Who was a stooge for, you know, for, he was an Austrian, he was a stooge for the, the Germans. And then he was gonna be, he was put in charge of, you know, uh, Austria. And then, of course, all of a sudden, we want to be part of the Nazi world, you know, so we're going to we're going to actually vote for annexation by greater Germany, you see. So you find people who are sympathetic to you, the Russians in this case, right, communists, more aptly put, right, because it's not about ethnic Russia, it's about communism. And then you drill them into the government and everybody else disappears. And then all of a sudden they have this big vote and they want to be part of the Soviet Union, you know, and everybody kind of knows it's a sham. And all of those countries behind the Iron Curtain, um, to one extent or another, were chafing at the bit of communism until the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that's how all of that happened. The Truman Doctrine, which is a very, very important aspect of our foreign policy, um, was happened right at that particular point. The United States comes up with a policy and it's, it's history refers to it as the Truman Doctrine, right? Where the United States will protect um, countries seeking their own freedom uh, and we will help those countries resist outside pressures, right? From flipping their countries. You see, we're talking specifically about the Soviet Union. So right at that point in 1947, Harry Truman um, commits the United States in an, in an open-ended agreement to any country, anywhere, anytime that is under the threat of being co-opted by the Soviet Union and flipped into a Soviet satellite state. And that sets the tone for the rest of the Cold War, right? Everything, everything we did, everything we did uh, overtly, covertly, the CIA, special forces, everything was in the context of the Truman Doctrine. So we were keeping a close eye after the war of where the Germans were trying to infiltrate, uh, where the Russians were trying to actually gain a foothold, right? And these places were in um, Southeast Asia. They were in Central and South America, and obviously in Europe, right? Right at the point of the speech that was the Truman Doctrine speech, um, the event that precipitated that was our announcement that we were going to support Turkey and Greece specifically. So I think it was 1947. You know, Great Britain is 
Great Britain is still rolling up its wartime footprint. Um, the United States is still wrapping up its wartime footprint after World War II. And um, the British realize that as soon as they take their garrison forces out of two places, one, Turkey, and two, Greece, that a vacuum of authority and power will exist, and that power vacuum will immediately be replaced by the Soviet Union. So they, the British, in conjunction with us, um, decide that we can't allow that to happen from the standpoint of resisting communism, right? Do you wanna have more countries behind the Iron Curtain? The answer is no. You see, so what we do, the United States, actually goes to the defense of Turkey and Greece, and we actually pump them full of armament and weapons so that they can actually be in the American sphere or the Western sphere of influence, you see? You see, and it's specifically there so that we're filling that vacuum, albeit not with, as we would say today, troops on the ground, you see, we're not sending our own garrison force in, but we're sending them. Um, I worked on a ship that came back from Greece. That was a ship that the United States had in, uh, at the end of World War II. Uh, it was almost new that we sent to um, Greece. And it was a destroyer, destroyer escort, actually. And uh, the Greeks now had a whole Navy because we literally gave it to them. Right, we gave it to them. And so it is kind of like an investment that the United States made in countries that it's like, this is gonna be cheaper than going to war, right? And uh, this is the argument that we're using right now in Ukraine. It's kind of like, you have to stop Vladimir Putin and this is gonna cost billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars, but it's still better than being in an actual war, you see? So we sent a whole ton of stuff to Turkey under, it was the same kind of a program as Len Lease was, right? Where we sent Great Britain a whole bunch of stuff and they didn't have the money to pay for it, you see? And to Russia for that matter as well. Um, and we sent all of this stuff because we had a tremendous surplus of the stuff. I mean, when we were wrapping up World War II, I mean, we had thousands of ships, we had thousands of aircraft. Uh, all kinds of weapons of any type, you know, and we sent them to Turkey, we sent them to Greece, and they were able to arm themselves, and it was enough to sustain them as being non-Soviet states, which was our primary goal at that point. And this is a, uh, a quintessential Cold War story, you see, and everybody, everything else you can change the names, you can change the faces, you can change the dates, you can change the players, you know, but, but it's a basically the same thing. It is the containment of Soviet communism, right? And, um, and that's where that started right there. So after Greece was done with the ship, by the way, 1991, they were like, all right, we're gonna scrap the ship. Does anybody want it? You know, and then so being in the marine preservation business as I was back in those days, you know, especially from the naval aspect of things, here you're going to get a World War II Navy destroyer that basically was like a time capsule, you know, because the Greeks were still using junk on that ship that we found obsolete by 1950. They they were still using it. So you know, if you got the ship back, you didn't even have to restore it from that standpoint. So actually, we were able to um, get the ship and have it towed all the way back to, well, New York. I was there when it came in. It was unbelievable, right? It was an American ship. It was like a time capsule from World War II, literally. And it had, you know, they, they had taken the American stickers and replaced it with these Greek stickers, right? And then all the rest of that stuff. Other than that, it was exactly the same as it was. It was a time capsule. And they had changed the toilets, by the way. They had changed the toilets from the, this, um, the Americans on those ships had this troughed, Right, so you would sit on a toilet seat on top of a trough, right? And the waste products would just sort of like run in this, this sort of like stream of water. And the Greeks got rid of that and they, and they just had holes in this tiled floor. So I guess you squatted over the hole or something. But anyway, um, I don't know if that has any historical value for you.
<laughs> I found it interesting. And um, so there is Turkey and Greece and it started, it's, it literally was set the template for 30 more years, right? We must not let the Soviets get a hand on anything anywhere, you see, because the overall theory that we were working on was that anywhere there was a communist state, right? It was gonna be part of some global communist bloc that was intended to fulfill the stated goal of the communist party, which was to create global socialism, right? Which would have to mean the end of the United States, at least the way we knew it from a, uh, a 1950s kind of perspective. You see what I mean? So you would have to, we, we would have a godless society. We would have a top-down authoritarian society. Everything would be, there would be the end of private property um, and all the rest of that. You know, so if you wanted the United States to still be the constitutional republic it was designed to be with individual freedoms and your ability to pray to God and, and think that there was something larger than government, then you have to stop communism, you see? And communism was evil because it's literally the antichrist, right? If you're gonna get rid of God, that means it's the antichrist. And so, I mean, it, it becomes this zero sum game is zero sum game. It's either them or it's us, right? And um, so there's some seeds of the Cold War, right? And let's see, I got 18 minutes left. Let me tell you about victory over Germany and Japan. Um, I gave you victory over Germany. Let me give you victory over Japan. Right. As you know, the war in Europe was over in May 45. The war in the Pacific was not over, right? This, this until August, right? So, so it's uh, June, July, August, three months, right? Which seemed like a long time, but I guess it wasn't, right? And, um, so by this point in time now, you have all of this massive amount of men and material that are actually converging in either the Philippine Islands and or Okinawa, right? The purpose of the invasion and the capture of Okinawa was to have a major landing area to launch an attack off of onto Japan proper, right? Uh, Operation Downfall. And um, it was uh, the two individual names. Uh, one of them was Operation Coronet. I forgot the other name of the other one. It doesn't matter. The invasion of Kyushu, right, and Honshu, right, which would have made, had it actually happened, it would have made D Day look relatively small in comparison. You see, so before the atomic bombs were dropped, during these agreements, like um, at the Tehran conference between FDR and Stalin and Churchill, and also the Potsdam conference uh, post FDR. So you have Truman now, Stalin and, um, well, Churchill was there also. Right, but it was really Clement Attlee who was about to be the new prime minister of Great Britain. Right, the, the thing is, is like, yeah, we're gonna need all hands on deck for the invasion of Japan, right? So the, um, we had actually asked the, uh, the Russians if they wanted to be part of that, you know? And, you know, Russia was non-committal on it. I mean, because it's gonna mean a whole nother war. And it should be noted as a side note that, you know, for Japan, Russia was always the traditional ally. I mean, uh, enemy, right? R I mean, Japan and Russia always had this adversarial stance towards each other in the Asian peninsula, uh, the, the Asian landmass, right? Um, because they were all ex expecting to be invaded by each other. So that, that was occurred since the Russo-Japanese War right from 1905, that was like a legacy thing. 
So now what happens here is that the Americans, as you're aware, drop the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, right, on August 6th. And uh, back in Potsdam, back during Potsdam, the Potsdam conference back in Germany, um, Harry Truman issues something that is known uh, by historians as the Potsdam Declaration. And he says to the Japanese that you need to surrender. And if you don't surrender, we're basically going to annihilate your country, right, from the air. And um, of course, you know, the, the Japanese don't respond to that. First atomic bomb, August 6, 1945. Right after that, the Russians declare war on Japan. So we drop the first atomic bomb, the Russians declare war on Japan. And this gives Stalin the green light. Remember I told you how he mopped up all of that territory on the way to Germany that he never intended to give back, right? So the, it's like, well, yeah, we've got to invade Germany. So of course we're gonna bring all our troops through here, right? But intentionally we're gonna keep all of this. And that's really the purpose of the operation, right? So he does the same thing now in the Asian sphere, right? The second atomic bomb is dropped on August 9th. And then a couple of days later, the whole thing is, is over, right? The Japan accepts the Potsdam Declaration with one caveat, which is that the emperor be retained at least as a symbolic figure, okay? So boom, the war's over, but Russia doesn't stop, right? Russia keeps fighting the Japanese and chasing the Japanese right, through portions of China, et cetera, right, all the way down to Korea. And um, this is another operation where Russia is using to essentially vacuum up as much territory until they don't have the justification to do it anymore, you see. And at the end of the war, um, the question is, how do you administer the Pacific region? And I told you about how the, the, um, the European region was administered, right? Remember I told you that the Russians were in the Russian zone and the British were in the British zone and all the rest of that, the Americans, the French. Now, the thing is, is the difference between the European war and the Pacific war is that the United States even though the British had a claim of victory over the Japanese, right, um, as much as we did, the British. For the Americans, it was kind of a personal thing, right? And I'm not saying this is a rational thing. I'm not saying it's, a, it's an adult thing, right? But the Americans were like, you guys attacked us on Pearl Harbor and if there's going to be somebody who's going to be going over there and saying we're in charge now in Japan, it ain't going to be the British, and it certainly ain't going to be the Russians. It's going to be us, and that's the way we wanted it. So we already had enough experience in the ensuing three months. The Truman administration had already had enough experience about seeing that the Russians had really no intention of following anything they said they were going to do in their agreements. From those three months between the end of World War II in Europe and what just happened to end the war in the Pacific, that we didn't want them anywhere near Japan. This is ours. You stay out. Okay. And the United States went to Tokyo Bay and we had on our big battleship the surrender documents. And it was an American show. Sure, we had all of the, we had the Australian admirals and the British admirals and everybody else there, but this was like a 99% American show, okay? And it was America that actually took over Japan and ran it for the next five years, right? Under the, under the new emperor who was one General Douglas MacArthur, you see? I mean, there is no way 
that we were going to divide Japan and wind up with the same damn headache of having to kiss the ass of the Russians and everybody else about how to administer that country and knowing that the Russians were never going to have any intention of giving back anything that they were going to administer. You see? So that's why Japan was never divided the way that Germany was. But after all, the Russians are our allies. And after all, the Russians joined the war in case we needed to invade Japan. And after all, we have to give them something. So what do we give the Russians? We let them administer the top half of Korea, while we administer the bottom half of Korea, you see? So that was kind of like, here, you can run this, you see? And so that's so, so arbitrarily, practically, this line was drawn across Korea at, as you're well aware, the 38th parallel, right? And the Russians created a government in North Korea that matched their government, which obviously was a communist government, and we created a government that matched our sensibilities, which was obviously not a communist government, right? South Korea. And um, the thing is, is that see, Korea wasn't a country that could just be liberated from the Japanese, right? Because the Japanese had held it and then go back to being Korea because there was no Korea to go back to because Korea is a country that had actually been colonized by the Japanese since like, I think it was 1910, 1907, 1910, see? So Korea was a nation that had already been taken over by the Japanese. So it was another nation that after World War II was essentially a power vacuum, right? So, the idea, of course, like Germany, was that, Ru that Russia was going to administer North Korea, as it's now known. And then we were going to administer South Korea. They were going to have some meeting of the minds, the North and the South Koreans, to figure out who they wanted to be and how. And then they were going, and then we were all going to leave. And then Korea was going to be Korea, you see. But that was never going to happen because. Russia made sure that North Korea was fully communist and we made sure that South Korea wasn't. So it wasn't gonna ever be, you know? So, and then I'll tell you the story about how the Korean War starts after that. Um, but that's how, that's how Korea got split, which leads us into what I'll do next time which is going to be, well, I actually did the Iron, uh, next time we have, I have written here, the Iron Curtain, the Truman Doctrine. I actually hit a couple of those things today. Um, the Marshall Plan, which is something also very important. Uh, Post-colonization and emerging nationalism, that will have to do with um, Korea and uh, other places. And then Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh, Kim Il-sung, Pol Pot, Fidel Castro. So that's the next era of the Cold War, right? Um, one of the most important things to remember here also, I'll tell you now, is that in a post-World War II world, right, where Great Britain has essentially relinquished its hold on all of its empire, right? So in other words, uh, India, go do what you gotta do. You know, fight it out with Pakistan, figure it out. OK, um, you have the now the United Nations um, and you have um, Great Britain giving up this thing called British mandated Palestine, which was at the end of World War One during the Treaty of Versailles. Great Britain gets to be the caretaker of this enormous region in the Middle East that used to be the Ottoman Empire which ceased to exist at the end of World War I, right? So the Brit this was always, frankly, a millstone around Great Britain's neck. I mean, it was a millstone, yet at the same time, you know, they were able to have a secure oil supply, right? So, but, but what, what a pain in the neck it was for the British, because the Arabs were always like, 
why are you letting all these Jews in here? You know, and the Jews were like, how come you're not letting us in here? You see, and it was always this thing between the Arabs and the Jews and the Arabs and the Jews and the Arabs and the Jews, you see, and it was just, it, it drove the British crazy. It really did. Um, and they couldn't wait to get rid of British mandated Palestine, you know, um, and there was one country that didn't want to give up its pre-war colonies, right? And that country, particularly, notably, was Charles de Gaulle's France, right? Now, Charles de Gaulle had seen France. I mean, this has a lot to do with pride and honor. And I mean, you know, maybe if I was French, I would see it differently, but I doubt it, okay? The French, Charles, Charles de Gaulle, found it to be a tremendous stain on the flag of France, that the fact that the that the France became this disgusting thing called Vichy France upon the uh, capitulation to the Germans. And so Charles de Gaulle actually creates a government and in absentia, right, the free French who never recognized the Vichy French government and are always going to be like, well, we, the real French, are going to land on the beaches of France and Normandy and we're going to recapture what is rightly ours for the real French people. And Vichy French is just this one like crazy, disgusting aberration, okay, that happened to occur. And, but, but post-World War II, uh, Charles de Gaulle wasn't comfortable with the United States being the primary role player in the new Western world, right? France was, was between France and Great Britain, which were the leaders of the free world before World War II. I mean, Charles de Gaulle didn't want to take a second seat to NATO or the United States after World War II. I mean, he was set on restoring France's power and dignity and authority in the world after what he felt was a uh, a stain uh, that was the capitulation of France in 1940. So after the Japanese are defeated, right, the Japanese are occupying what? French Indochina, otherwise known as Vietnam. And France has no intention of giving that up. And everybody's expecting them to give it up. Right. Because come on, you know, it's it's like, listen, it's it's 1947 here, you know, give it up, you know, let the let the Vietnamese go be the Vietnamese. You see, France goes back in and they assert control back over the entire country of Vietnam. So the Vietnamese go from being occupied or colonized by the French to then being occupied and colonized by the Japanese. And then only to get rid of the Japanese and thinking that's where their freedom is gonna be right at that point to be then having the French reimpose themselves on the Vietnamese, you see? And then this lasts in another war till 1954, right? At the hands of the North Vietnamese at the French defeat, at a place called BNDM Phu. And the United States of America is standing back watching this. And we can't say that we're in favor of European colonialism because that is against our foreign policy. We can't say that we're for one European nation or any nation for that matter, going into and actually just usurp usurping another nation. But France had us over a bit of a barrel, you see, because France in the 1950s was giving the United States a hard time about its commitment to NATO, right? France wanted to do its own thing to show that it wasn't going to be subservient to a large organization that was going to be run by the Americans. 
So to show solidarity in Europe and showing that you had a kind of unanimity and having France on board, the United States made a, shall I say, Faustian bargain with the French that we would support them in trying to hold on to Vietnam. And if we did that, the French would give us less of a hard time about supporting us with NATO in Europe. So we had sowed this deal with France that we would support them in Europe if we would support them in holding on to their overseas empire, which was, which was our uh, mistake. Okay, insert word here. And that we had completely betrayed our, our, our core values and became hypocrites right at that very juncture. Anyway, I think I'm gonna leave it right there for, our, for today. All right, I th hope you uh, found that informative and I wanna thank you for joining me today. Uh, sorry for Vladimir Putin for saying that I was gonna stab him in the eye, okay? Right, I want that on record. And um, anything for me before we leave? Anyone have any questions for Art before we wrap up for today? Now is your chance. Okay. All right. Oh, we just had a Susan said very, th thank you, very interesting. It was a very interesting um, lecture today, Art, absolutely. Um, for those of you who came in a little bit on the latter side of the lecture, uh, I want to just let everyone know that if you missed session number one, it is posted on our YouTube page. Um, and for this session, uh, we will post it hopefully by the end of today, and I will make sure to send out a message to everyone later this week uh, to let you know when it is posted on our YouTube. Uh, thank you again, Art, for your time. And our next session will be November 2nd, so we'll see you all November 2nd. Thank you everyone for coming out and I hope to see you all very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.